Okay, yeah, I think uh, that's okay. I think that's cool. Are we we want to start, well, let's give it a few more minutes so people can come in. Okay. Okay, so uh, maybe we should uh, start. How is it? Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Um, first, I want to remind you that uh, there will be there will be no class next week. Uh, I'm out of town, so we will meet uh, in two weeks' uh, time. Um, this week, uh, we're dealing with uh, this part of uh, Grundrisse that runs from around 373 to page 423. Uh, there's this wonderful opening comment in uh, uh, the notebook four opening, where Mark says, this highly irksome calculation will not delay us further. Uh, having gone through about 20 pages of irksome calculations. Uh, and if you look at page 370, there's a most incredible paragraph which is full of all kinds of weird translations, you know, numbers and God knows exactly what they, 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 they mean. Um, but then, of course, Marx goes on for another 12 or 15 pages of uh, irksome calculations. Uh, during which he does, uh, however, also try to reassure us that he needs to uh, get on with things. And uh, so he sort of says, well, uh, on page 386, 
He says, okay, it is now time to finish with the question of the value resulting from the growth of the productive forces. And on the next page he says, we now come to the point where we last broke off. And the footnote uh, uh, tells us that uh, what this is is from page 353. So from page 353 to 387, He's been on this uh, long detour. Uh, and, w w and I think it is important to make a few remarks as to uh, what this detour is about, because it's not really a detour so much as it is a, a probing beneath the surface to try to find out uh, exactly uh, what is going on. Now, uh, I think this is a moment where we might um, address one of the features of within the Marxist tradition, uh, which is a very strong emphasis upon production and the centrality of production to the whole argument. And this is sometimes interpreted, uh, wrongly in my view, as giving some sort of priority to production over everything else and that uh, once you understand production, then everything else falls into place, and that therefore uh, production is where uh, the game is at. Uh, I don't actually accept that. I, the point of my uh, the diagram that I, I like to use is to point out that production, distribution, consumption, uh, and the like are all key elements within a totality and that we need to look very closely at the role each one of them plays within the totality and to the degree that the totality is functional in some, in some way. <coughs> the breakdown at any one of these points within the totality uh, can actually send a shock uh, into the system and uh, stop it uh, dead cold. For instance, in the uh, diagram, the tightly organized questions of distribution and consumption, realization, uh, along with production, exist in a broader context. And part of that context, is, at the bottom of the diagram, is the metabolic relation to nature. And right now we have a very good example of what happens when the metabolic relation to nature goes wonky. Um, and there were some, I think, some astonishing reactions to it. Uh, for example, when this uh, virus existence was first announced, the stock market went down for one day and then the day after, for all sorts of days after, shot up uh, very high. And you kind of go, why was that happening when you would have thought this was going to be a serious shock to the system, and only in the last three days uh, does it seem that investors have got to the idea that the metabolic relation to nature is uh, in involved in such a way as to uh, threaten uh, the whole circulation and accumulation of capital. Uh, of course, it threatens it in differential ways. So. My argument in, in this is to say we all, all have to look at all of the moments in this process uh, as uh, having the potentiality uh, to disrupt the crises can form around any one of the moments and be generated out of any one of the moments and that we cannot simply say the only crisis that matters is the crisis of production because all of them are uh, very significant. Uh, to the functioning of the, of the, and the operation uh, of the totality. But uh, I would make a, a point, and this is why I think this long section of the Grundrisse is important to look at and to try to understand what, what Marx is doing. Because I think what is true is that what happens at the, total, at, at the point of production is something which is very different from what happens elsewhere and that therefore uh, we, we need to investigate the production process with different tools and with a different logic and a different understanding 
than is the case when we're looking at something that's happening in the market or something that's happening in the metabolic relation to nature. Uh, and this special qualitative difference, I think, between what happens within the production process and what is going on elsewhere is that elsewhere you can see things going, you can see the exchanges, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not too hard to figure out what's going on, but within production it's much harder to figure out what's going on. Uh, and in Capital, for those of you familiar with that uh, book, you'll find in Volume 1 uh, Marx talks about what's going on in the market, where everything's transparent and you can understand it all. But as soon as you go behind the locked doors of production and go into the, quote, hidden abode of production, you're in a different world and there's a different logic and there's a different kind of set of uh, questions uh, that are being posed. So that you're in a qualitatively different world. And I think, for me anyway, that is a very important distinction that kind of says there is something special about the process of production. And what is special, of course, is that what is happening in the point of production is that the creation of value. And as we know, value, as Marx puts it, is something which is, uh, a, a f has a phantom objectivity. It's a social relation. It's not a thing. It cannot be measured directly. And that value is created through the collision of capital and labor. And in effect, what Marx has done is to set up uh, what happens at the point of production in terms of, uh, if you like, a coupling of uh, capital and labor. So that capital completes itself uh, to the degree that it colonizes labor and actually creates the possibility for labor to live through necessary labor. So there's that kind of side of it. On the other side, l labor uh, completes itself in the other of capital, and therefore labor is capital. And it is this coupling of capital and labor that is the coupling which gives rise to value. Now this may sound a kind of a, a, a strange way to think of things, but uh, I suppose I could you know, try and make Marx a bit sexy, like it's a bit like falling in love and the coupling that goes on uh, in love. But nobody knows what love is and nobody quite can measure it. It's not as if you can come out with certain you know, elements of love or atoms of love or something like that. So th there is a, and there's a coupling which is going on. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that this is something that is, is Marx is trying to get at here. So when you get to the question of production, you want to know what the rules of the game are inside of the coupling of capital and labor. And immediately then comes the question of, well, in the coupling of uh, capital and labor, uh, capital at first buys these commodities, labor power, and means of production. And one of the immediate questions is, well, how much means of production can a given laborer work with? And that then says there's a mediation here, which, which is the technology, uh, which is going to be actually affecting the productivity of labor. So the amount of labor you, meet, you need relative to the amount of means of production you're going to process uh, varies a great deal. Uh, in Capital, Marx uses the example of the uh, power loom weaver versus the hand loom weaver. Uh, the hand loom weaver has uh, a lot of labor involved in the activity and uh, not too much uh, means of production. The power loom, on the other hand, one laborer can use a vast amount of means of production so that the distinction between uh, the, the, the two situations is one of changing productivity and Marx recognizes of course that capital is always about revolutions in, in technology and that therefore the ratio between uh, the labor that you need and the means of production is constantly changing and what does that do for the total output uh, and what does that also, also do 
to the relationship between necessary labor, which is that labor which is required to re reproduce the value of labor power, and the surplus labor, uh, which is going to be appropriated by capital, and is, of course, the very form in which capital is reproduced and actually produced. So what Marx is doing in, in the sections with this tedious calculations is to say, well, let's suppose we have 60 units of, uh, of means of production and 40 units of uh, uh, labor power, and uh, there is a rate of exploitation which says 40 units of labor power can be reproduced in six hours. So if we work the laborer for another six hours, we get 40 units of surplus value. It's those kinds of calculations. And then he starts to say, and then what happens when you take uh, the surplus value and you pull it back round, and it's in the same ratios as before, and you do it again and again, so you circle around like this. So a lot of the calculations are that sort of thing. But what he's effectively doing is saying, we re need to take very seriously uh, the question of the productivity of labor and how the productivity of labor affects and in what way it affects uh, the surplus value which is, which is produced. Uh, and uh, the irksome calculations uh, are, are about trying to do that. But you know, it, it, he does it in a much simpler way uh, in capital when he kind of says, well, I'm going to call all of the means of production which are taken in here constant capital, and I'm going to put all of the labor power as variable capital, and then I'm going to ask what's the ratio of constant to variable capital, and how does that change through technological dynamism. So uh, these pages are very much uh, ab uh, about as a prelude uh, to that argument in capital where he distinguishes uh, between constant and variable capital, which he doesn't use those categories here, but, but they're much easier to work with. Uh, than uh, is this kind of constant business of uh, how many units of uh, means of production and how many units of labor do you need uh, and, and, and what's going on with them. So, but the creation of value then is a, a, an incredibly important process. And like I say, it's the creation of a social relation. And it is therefore in itself invisible it is, the, you know, as Marx says, the phantom objectivity, the Im immaterial uh, of, of the things, which, which has, nevertheless, objective consequences. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, what we're looking at is, 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 that, is, that, uh, is that process. So this um, uh, is important uh, also because once you start to partition uh, what is going on in the production process into these uh, relationships which exist between constant capital or means of production on the one hand and labor power deployed on the other and the capitalist is using one uh, in relationship to the other and laying out the, the, the initial value so that, cap so that labor can complete itself and reproduce itself through the production of necessary labor. And, and Marx jokingly says at some point or other, it's rather as if uh, labor has to pay capital for the privilege of reproducing itself, uh, uh, allowing uh, the laborer to produce necessary labor to cover their own costs of uh, reproduction. Um, so this is what's going on within this, this thing. And there are a couple of things, however, which uh, it's in interesting to look at. And uh, let me pick this uh, up here. Because one of the issues which comes out uh, of all this, these, these irksome calculations is, all right, how much value is produced? How much surplus value is produced uh, through these operations? And what's the relationship between the surplus value produced and the surplus value that's deployed, or the value that's initially deployed. In other words, what the, labor, what the capitalist lays out in value, what's the relationship of that to the surplus value, and, and uh, how, does, uh, how does all of that work? And one of the things he begins to see here is that to the degree that, that labor becomes more and more productive, uh, so less and less labor is employed relative to the total capital advanced, 
Uh, and when that's the case, you start here to get the first kind of hints that Marx is, is getting towards a uh, falling rate of profit argument because the labor deployed uh, is uh, diminishing relative to the total capital advanced. And if labor is the source of value, and if the rate of surplus value remains constant, then with a constant rate of surplus value, then technological innovation will automatically lead you to a falling rate of profit. And this is something which is dynamic in the system. Uh, and, and that is a very different way of looking at things than uh, sometimes uh, is used when we're simply looking at the expansion of the system. And this is beginning to get us into some problematic uh, territory. Uh, and on 375, he raises, I think, a very interesting question. And I could either delay this till much later or deal with it uh, right here. And I think it's interesting to deal with it here. When he says on 375, the identity of surplus gain with surplus labor time, absolute and relative, so he's already got this idea of absolute surplus value and relative surplus value, sets a qualitative, qualitative limit on the accumulation of capital, namely the working day. The working day is limited. There's only 24 hours in it. If you're working somebody for 12 hours a day, then you, know, you try to go to 14 hours a day. There's a limit to the length of the working day so that if you're looking to expand surplus value production uh, by extending the length of the working day, then you hit that limit. So th that's, a f that's the first limit, namely the working day, the amount of time out of 24 hours during which labor capacity can be active the degree to which the productive forces are developed, and the population, which expresses the number of simultaneous working days, etc. So you can expand your surplus value two ways. You can either increase the rate of exploitation by working people for more hours, or you can work them the same hours, but you now just simply employ more people, in which case you've got the problem of the working population. What is the total working population uh, that you've got? So there's a limit. Uh, another limit. So the two limits, one the length of the working day and the other limit is the total population available uh, to be employed as wage labourers, which of course on a global level is pretty huge. Uh, Three billion or so workers right now can be employed. So th those are the two, two, two limits. Uh, and, and then he says uh, uh, this contrasts with um, notorious Dr. Price's compound interest calculation. Uh, and, and then he goes on and says something like, practice has shown the economists that Price's interest multiplication is impossible, but they have never discovered the blunder contained in it. Uh, and then in a, 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 a footnote, uh, we see that uh, this is taken up on page 842 to 3. So let me go up there. Now, there was this fascination at the end of the 18th century with compound interest and what compounding and exponential growth uh, would look like. And this, of course, is one of the theses that Malthus used to say that human populations can increase at an exponential rate, and the exponential rate is very different uh, than it is at a simple uh, interest rate. But Dr. Price was one of those who had got behind this, uh, and uh, Marx uh, cites the following. Money bearing compound interest increases at first slowly, but the rate of increase being continually accelerated, it becomes in some time so rapid as to mock all the powers of the imagination. One penny put out at our Saviour's birth to 5% compound interest would before this time have increased to a greater sum than would be obtained in 150 millions of Earths, all solid gold. But if put out to simple interest, it would in the same time have amounted to no more than seven shillings, four and a half, four and a quarter pence, four and a half pence. Interesting. Compounding growth is seriously problematic. 
that if you get yourself on a trajectory of compounding growth, now uh, this was taken up by uh, the Prime Minister at the time, William Pitt, who kind of looked at it and said, well, hey, this is one of the good ways in which you could actually retire the national debt. If you wanted to retire the national debt of the United States, all you need is to invest, you know, $10 at 5% compound interest. And, and in, in 200 years, it will be, uh, you know, 50 times the whole gold supply of the earth, and, and, and you could get rid of the, you know, so, so in, in effect, uh, the interest would, of that would, would completely uh, destroy uh, or, or, or compensate for, for, for the national, national debt. So Pitt had decided that that's what they were going to do, and they set up something called a sinking fund. They put a certain amount of money in there and hoped that this would then retire the national debt through compounding of the interest. But Marx is kind of saying, you know, they clearly don't understand where value is coming from. And if interest is a portion of value, he mixes up interest and surplus value here, by the way, which is also a bit of a muddle. Um, but if you, if, if you uh, recognize uh, that the expansion of the system has these limits, the limit of the length of the working day, and the limit of the total population, then you would see that you cannot have an exponential growth uh, process because of these barriers and these limits. And this question of where are the barriers and where are the limits uh, start to become rather important in some of the argument that, uh, that then, then follows, which is why I will take that up uh, uh, here. So that the price type of compound growth expansion uh, is the kind of fable that economists might uh, use when they imagine that there's some sort of natural rate of interest uh, which accumulates. And I think it's, it is an interesting kind of, kind of fact that most people, if they put their money in an interest-bearing account, never ask the question, where does the interest come from? And Marx kind of says, well, it's part of surplus value. And, and, and to the degree that surplus value is, is limited by these constraints which he's put here, which is the total population and uh, the length of the working day, uh, to that degree, that's there. As the, uh, as the limiting factor, then you, that checks uh, the possibility of, a, of, of, of compounding interest. But uh, in my own work right now, I'm actually using the price thing, very important, because as soon as money disaggregates from value and we start to get uh, a money system which is no longer checked by either the existence of gold or the existence of these barriers which Marx is talking about. In other words, if capital finds some way to leap across these barriers, it will actually get into a logic of compounding growth. And right now I would want to argue that the logic of compounding growth is actually becoming a very serious problem because the money system has disaggregated itself and, and from the value uh, production. And to the degree that it has done that, so we get the circulation of what Marx calls fictitious capitals, and we start to get, of course, fictitious credit monies and all the rest of it, which start to enter into uh, the picture. So this is an, an interesting argument which is going on here, but Marx is kind of uh, himself is mocking uh, the price interest multiplication uh, argument and saying we have to think about something which is radically different. Now, this is really all I want to say about this whole kind of uh, question of uh, production and the significance of, of production. Uh, it needs to be cleaned up, obviously, in terms of Marx's terminology, uh, and it is a lot of this is cleaned up uh, in, 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 in capital and much more uh, effectively. But what Marx then does is to start to move into something rather different uh, when he, uh, about page 398 uh, onwards, and this moves us uh, somewhere uh, 
in the diagram from the first red box of production into what goes on in, rela in the relationship between that and the second box, which is the, the point of realization of, of value in the market. So what's the relationship? This is what we now uh, start to address. Um, but he concludes uh, uh, the, the stuff about production by, by saying uh, on 398, that just as capital on one side creates surplus labor, surplus labor is at the same time equally the presupposition of the existence of capital. And he then talks a little further about that uh, and says that, uh, that the relationship between necessary labor and surplus labor is something we always be, have to be looking at. And we have to look at it in the context of changes in uh, the forces of production, the, the force of social production, and that this is going to have to be uh, part and parcel of his future study. But Padma 398, he lays out this. He says, surplus time is the excess of the working day above that part of it which we will call necessary labor time. It exists, secondly, as a multiplication of simultaneous working days, i.e. of the laboring population. This is the argument, okay, that we've already seen, the limits, which are, you've got this, the working day and you've got the total population. Uh, the first relation, he says on 399, that of the surplus time and the necessary time in the day can be and is modified by the development of the productive forces. Uh, so that necessary labor is restric restricted to a constantly smaller fractional part. Now, there are two issues here. One is, what is necessary labor time uh, for, uh, for the laborer? Which is the necessary labor time for the production of the means of, production, of reproduction of the laborer. In other words, take wage goods. It's what, what's the value of the wage goods needed to reproduce the labor at a given standard of living? That's really the definition which is involved here. Uh, if there is technological innovation, then those wage goods can be had at a cheaper price. And if the value of the wage goods is, is declining because the productivity in the wage goods sector is rising, then what you see is the reduction in the value of labor power. The material standard of living remains the same, but that material standard of living is enforced by much lower, uh, by, by much more productive labor in the wage goods sector. Um, a contemporary example of this would be that to the degree that actual wages uh, real wages have not increased very much over the last 30, 40 years. The big question is, with a fixed wage over 30 or 40 years, have the working class become better off in terms of the material goods they can command with those wages? And the answer is the Walmart economy and using you know, highly exploited labor from China and everything else it allows the and the U.S. working class to achieve the same standard of living as it's always had with a lower relative wage rate um, because the goods it needs to survive uh, are, are much cheaper. And of course, e the material living standard can even increase on a, on a fairly static wage if the wage goods are produced at, uh, and more and more and different wage goods are produced. So. So this is the first relation which is, which is uh, important. And he then goes on to say that the necessary labor is also restricted to a constantly s smaller fractional part of the population. And it is a law of capital, he says, to create surplus labor. It can do this only by setting necessary labor in motion. So it has, and this is this kind of idea that 
that, that capital is, is, is actually allowing uh, labor to reproduce its conditions of existence. It is therefore equally a tendency of capital to increase the laboring population as well as constantly to posit a part of it as surplus population, population which is useless until such time as capital can utilize it. Hence the correctness of the theory of surplus population and surplus capital. Capital will produce both a surplus population of unemployed at the same time as it's producing surplus capital. So it will do both of those things simultaneously. Now this is a very important argument for, for, for Marx and I think it's one which we need to take very seriously in terms of understanding and the dynamics of what's going on us, around us today. Um, it is equally a tendency of capital, he says, to make human labor relatively superfluous so as to drive it as human labor towards infinity. Now I don't know exactly what Marx has in mind when he's, I don't know what kind of infinity is being driven to. <laughs> but, but again, what, we're, what, what we certainly see is that uh, there is the possibility, which will crop up later, uh, of uh, actually capital being able to produce without using any labor at all. And I think this is the infinity that Marx has in mind. That, that and, and it is possible that that could happen, of course, with artificial intelligence and all those kinds of things. We are now seeing a conversation occurring around these sorts of things. So this is, this is if you like, where, where we're at in this. Um, at the same time as we're looking at this from the standpoint of the individual worker, so we can also start to look at the whole kind of relationship at the bottom of 399. He says, the working day regarded spatially, time itself regarded as space, is many working days alongside one another. In other words, the coming together of many laborers within the factory is the image which we're looking at here. The more working days capital can enter into exchange with at once, during which it exchanges objectified for living labor, the greater its realization at once. It can leap over the natural limit formed by one's, one individual's living working day uh, by the spatial addition of more simultaneous working days. This is why capital solicits the increase of population. Now this is one of the interesting themes that you do find in Marx's capital, which is rarely and Marx is thinking, which is, which is really made much of, which is the relationship between the continuous expansion of a capitalist system and increasing population. And uh, Marx does not talk about it very much, but when he does, he makes very clear that increase of population is a necessary condition for the long-term survival of capital. Because if there is no increase of population and you get uh, older populations, then there's a real problem of where's the labor going to come from, which is going to continue the expansion of the system. In other words, the barrier of lack of surplus population starts to become very significant. Now, there are about 50 countries in the world right now which have negative rates of population growth. This was not the case in Marx's time. Almost everywhere you would see, to some degree, uh, increasing rates of population growth, provided, of course, that there were the health conditions which allowed increasing life expectancy. So the capitalist era has been very much about uh, an increasing mass of population. But what Marx is saying here is that increasing mass of population, you don't kind of say it's being caused by capital, but you would say that the increasing mass of population is a condition of existence and perpetuation of the capitalist dynamic. So when you get aging populations, as has been the case in Japan and is the case in Italy, you often find uh, 
parts of the world where that is the case, which are, have difficulty of maintaining uh, their, their, their economic dynamic, uh, which, by the way, is one of the arguments in this country around the immigration question. Uh, the anti-immigration group is going on and on and on, but the big capital is saying, we need more workers. You know, the reason this country is where it is at, economically, has a lot to do with its open immigration policies, or its reasonably open uh, immigration policies. And that the dynamics of, of, of you know, if, if, if you seal off this country from a, a flow of immigrants, uh, then, of course, uh, you'll end up with uh, the sort of problems which exist in Japan, which is a relatively closed society, by the way, in terms of uh, immigration. Uh, the anti-immigrant uh, fervor in Japan is very strong. There's a Korean population, of course, which has been there for a very long time, but you know, the immigration question is, is, is uh, important here. Uh, but Marx does then com com comment that the increase of population is a natural force of labor for which nothing is paid. Uh, hence the tendency of capital simultaneously to increase the laboring population as to well as to reduce constantly its necessary part, constantly deposit a part of it as a reserve. And the increase of population itself is the chief means for reducing the necessary part. So this is uh, one of the elements which arises in the conclusion uh, of this long stuff about production of surplus value and the like. Which then brings us to uh, uh, the big switch, uh, which now takes place, which is on page 401. And the title of the session, it, section is The Transition from the Process of Production of Capital into the Process of Circulation. That is, we're now going to look at the relationship between the first red box of production and the second, which is about realization and monetization. And he starts straight out of saying there has to be uh, a certain unity established uh, between the process of production and the process of realization. The product, the process, capital itself. It's a very important phrasing here because Marx is saying that capital is not simply production. Capital is the unity of production and realization. And realization in this case is realization in the market. Now, Marx sometimes uses the term realization to talk about the realization of capital in the production process. But here he's talking about the realization of value in the market. Looked at precisely, he says, on page 402 in the middle, the realization process of capital, and money becomes capital only through the realization process, appears at the same time as its devaluation process. And this in two respects. First, to the extent that capital does not increase absolute labor time, but rather decreases the relative necessary labor time. So there's a devaluation which attaches to uh, the diminution of the labor content. Uh, and then he goes on to say, one part of the capital on hand is constantly devalued owing to a grease decrease in the cost of production at which it can be reproduced. If I have a machine which I bought for a million dollars and it's highly productive, and then somebody comes along and says, actually, we now produce that same machine for half a million dollars, then there's a devaluation of my machine. There's a devaluation of labor power. 
uh, as wage goods become cheaper. So we have to think about not only valuation, but also the prospect and possibility of devaluation, loss of value. If the production process cannot realize the value, then it is no, not value. And then Marx talks about the possibility of a constant devaluation of the existing capital. But then he goes on to say, this doesn't belong here since it already presupposes capital as completed. Devaluation of capital can take many, many forms. Uh, what does a private equity company do? Goes in and buys up a public company, privatizes it, slims it down, kicks out lots of people, asset strips, and then sells it back. This is an operation of devaluation. And it's, a, it's actually a conscious, in this case a conscious, but Marx is kind of saying devaluation processes of that sort are going on around us all of the time. If I think that I've produced a value of certain items, and then suddenly imports from Taiwan or Mexico of identical products turn up, which are half the price, then everybody's going to buy the half price ones. And my commodities, if I want to get rid of them, I've got to cut them in half, which is nowhere near what my cost. So there's a devaluation of my capital. So devaluation is going on all of the time through competition and through the dynamics of what is going on. And that devaluation starts to be felt in the relationship between production and realization. Production without realization means no value. Production with only partial realization means partial devaluation. So in order to get from, in order to maintain the value, I have to be able to get from production through the moment of realization. I have to be able to monetize that which I, the value which I have incorporated within the commodities. The devaluation being dealt with here is this, he says on top of 403, that capital has made the transition from the form of money into the form of a commodity of a product which has a certain price which is to be realized. In its money form, it existed as value. It now exists as product and only ideally as price, but not as value as such. In order to realize itself, i.e. to maintain and multiply itself as value, it would first have to make the transition from the form of money into that of use values, raw material, instrument wages, but it would thereby lose the form of value and it now has to enter anew into circulation in order to posit this form of general wealth anew. The capitalist now enters the process of circulation, not simply as one engaged in exchange, but as producer. And the others engaged in exchange are, relative to him, consumers. That is, you've got to find the consumer. And you've got to find a consumer who has enough money to pay the value equivalent of the commodity. Now this means, he says, that devaluation always forms one moment of the realization process. Therefore, while capital is reproduced as value, a new value in the production process, it is at the same time posited as not value, as something which first has to be realized as value by means of exchange. The three processes of which capital forms the unity are external. Notice, Marx is here postulating this unity of production and realization. But it's a contradictory unity and a problematic unity. 
The three processes, it says, are separate in time and space. As such, the transition from one into the other, i.e. their unity as regards the individual capitalists, is accidental. Despite their inner unity, they exist independently alongside one another, each as the presupposition of the other. You can't have realization without production, but production doesn't mean anything unless it's realized. So again, you get this completion of one moment through the operation of the other. So this is the beginnings then of this transition. Which leads him on 404 to say this. In the production process itself, where capital continued to be presupposed as value, its realization appeared totally dependent solely on the relation of itself as objectified labor to living labor, on the relation of capital to wage labor. But now as a product, as a commodity, it appears dependent on circulation, which lies outside this process. So realization can be achieved internally within the circuit, because if you produce means of production for other capitalists, then there's an internal. You could even make something which then becomes one of, you know, as an output, which becomes part of your own input. So there is an internal aspect of this within the realm of production itself. That the production of means of production, this loop in the diagram, the production of means of production means that you're selling back into the production system. You haven't escaped the production system. Now we have to look at what happens when the commodity escapes the production world and goes to that next red box, which is realization of value in the market. Now, this then says that there is an inside and an outside. every moment of production itself to exchange and to suspend the production of direct use values not entering into exchange, i.e. precisely deposit production based on capital in place of earlier modes of production. So that the very existence of absolute surplus value, as far as Marx is concerned, is predicated upon a constant expansion to the point where it's going to create the world market. Now, I, I, I mean, I find this a kind of interesting insight. I mean, here he is in 1858 saying, this system is going to create the world market. And here we are in the world market. And when people kind of say, where did it come from? And Marx is saying, it's in the nature of capital to do that. That's what it was bound to do. Now, when Marx was writing, it was, you know, the world market was a fairly trivial affair compared to what it is now. So, okay. But what does it do now? If this is its nature, that it has to keep on expanding, where is it going to go to now? It's already expanded to the, to the global level, there's not much space left to get into. Africa, yeah, okay. Some others. But most of the world's population is now caught up in the circulation of capital. 
and the realization process now actually involves you know, large segment, a majority I suspect, of the world's population. Whereas in Marx's time it was still a fairly small part. So the relationship between absolute surplus value and the production of the world market and the continued exploitation and creation and exploration of absolute surplus value, the, that continuation is predicated upon a, a continued expansion of the world market with uh, the big question mark right now, where is it going to Where's it going to go and how's it going to get there? On the other side, he says, the production of relative surplus value, i.e. the production of surplus value based on the increase and development of productive forces, requires the production of new consumption. Requires that the consuming circle within circulation expands as did the productive circle previously. Firstly, quantitative expansion of existing consumption. Secondly, creation of new needs by prop propagating existing ones in a, wider, in a wide circle. Thirdly, production of new needs and discovery and creation of new use values. In other words, so that the surplus labour gain does not remain a mere quantitative surplus but rather constantly increases the circle of quantitative differences within labour makes it more diverse, more internally differentiated. And this implies that capital and labour have to be set free to create new qualitatively different branches of production which satisfy and bring forth a new need. Now again, Marx doesn't deal a great deal with this, but the production of new needs So you create the world market, but you also create new needs. And then he goes on to say, the value of the old industry is preserved by the creation of the fund for a new one in which the relation of capital to labour posits itself in a new form. Hence, exploration of all of nature in order to discover new useful qualities in things. Universal exchange of the products of all alien climates and lands new preparation of natural objects by which they are given new use values, the exploration of the earth in all directions to discover new things as well as new useful qualities of the old, such as new qualities of them as raw materials, etc. The development, hence, of the natural sciences to their highest point, likewise the discovery, creation and satisfaction of new needs arising from society itself, cultivation of the qualities of the social human being, Production of the same in a form of rich, as rich as possible in needs, because rich in qualities and relations. All this corresponds, he says at the bottom of this paragraph of 409, to a constantly expanding and constantly enriched systems of needs. Bottom of the page, thus capital creates the bourgeois society and the universal appropriation of nature as well as of the social bond itself by the members of society. Hence the great civilizing influence of capital. Well, I don't know about that. But you can see what he's driving at. The production of new needs often is about not only the production of new po possibilities, but is about the production of new human beings, really, with new capacities and powers. So capital creates a bourgeois society, the universal appropriation of nature, and the social bond, hence the great civilizing influence of capital, is production of a stage of society in comparison to which all earlier ones appear as mere local developments of humanity and as nature idolatry. For the first time, nature becomes purely an object for humankind, purely a matter of utility, ceases to be recognized as a power for itself. And the theoretical discovery of its autonomous laws appears merely as a ruse, so as to subjugate it under human needs, whether as an object of consumption or as a means of production. 
In accord with this tendency, capital drives beyond national barriers and prejudices as much as beyond nature worship, as well as all traditional confined, complacent, encrusted satisfactions of present needs and reproductions of old ways of life. It is destructive towards all of this and constantly revolutionizes it, tearing down all the barriers which hem in the development of the forces of production, the expansion of needs, the all-sided development of production, and the exploitation and exchange of natural and mental forces. Now, this is all presented in well, uh, what seems to be uh, well, uh, positive, fairly positive connotations. And again, this is something which is, I think, distinctive about Marx. Well, he'll say all kinds of nasty things about the capitalists and all the rest of it, and the bourgeois. I think there's no question whatsoever that he admires very much what they've done. And this, for him, is very much about laying, laying, you know, laying the basis for an alternative kind of civilization, which is made possible by the kinds of innovations and the new need creations and the science and the willingness to explore the world in all directions and so on. Now I'm often asked how I could possibly, you know, justify in a sense, uh, the claim that China is headed towards the creation of a socialist society. Um, whether it is or not, I don't know. Um, whether it will get there or not, I don't know. But I think the claim has to be taken seriously, in part because if you read this, if Deng Xiaoping read this in 1978 and sat down with colleagues who said, look, we're not going to be able to create socialism unless we get all of this. How are we going to get all of this? Well, capital got all of this, so let's unleash the forces that capital unleashed in this civilizing mission, and let's get ourselves in a position where we command all this stuff, and then we can use it to build a socialist society. Now, whether they'll ever do that, I don't know. But you can see that actually when the, the claim is made, when Xi Jinping says, look, what we're doing rests very firmly on the basis that Marx created. And Lenin el elaborated, and Mao, and Deng Xiaoping, and then me. You know. There is, there is, there is a, a sort of justification here, right? And uh, you know, one of the sayings that Marx uh, uses in Capital, which I'm very fond of quoting, is that. Uh, the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessity is left behind. When you've got the productive capacity to turn the realm of necessity into a kind of sidebar, then you're free to do what you like. But in order to do that, you have to take care of the realm of necessity. And uh, I gather recently somebody told me that uh, actually at the time uh, Deng Xiaoping, that phrase about the world of freedom begins after the realm of necessity is left behind was, was actually quoted in, in the documents and they recognized that they needed to leave the, the realm of necessity behind and the only way they could do that was to raise the productivity of labor and the only way they could do that was to unleash the forces which typically and classically had done that as the bourgeoisie had done and given the exp explanation that's going on here now, it is very interesting that China in itself is suddenly finding that it has to colonize the world market. Uh, 
and, and you know, as it moves towards relative surplus value, it's beginning to move into many of these, these things. Now, I think there's a, there's a case to be made, not necessarily fully in support of that. I feel very uncomfortable personally about uh, nature becoming a, purely an object for humankind, a matter of utility, uh, and ceasing to think about nature as having any power in itself. Um, and I think the kind of thesis of the domination of nature is really problematic and gets, it gets you into trouble uh, for all sorts of reasons. But, uh, so there, there, there's, I think, a very interesting case to be made for a critical discussion of the propositions in this passage. What do we say about these propositions? But we also know, and this goes back to the discussion we had earlier about the transformation of capital circulation into the spiral form and the spiraling that goes on. And here we're talking about a spiraling that produces the world market, which produces new wants and needs, new systems of production. All of this is going on. And then Marx kind of says, you know, capital, it is in the nature of capital to posit every limit as a barrier. And so capital gets ideally beyond it. When he says ideally, he is constantly struggling to think through how to get past the barrier. Uh, because every limit is a barrier, it does not by any means follow that it, it can really overcome it. And since every such barrier contradicts its character, its production moves in contradictions which are constantly overcome, but just as constantly posited. In other words, this expansionism is, is, is a contradictory process and runs into all sorts of uh, barriers. The universality, he says, towards which it irresistibly strives encounters at a certain point barriers in its own nature, which will, at a certain stage of its development, allow it to be recognized as being itself the greatest barrier to this tendency and hence will drive towards its own suspension. In other words, Marx has laid out here uh, the positive side, but then kind of said, you know, but this system, through its expansionary forms, generates contradictions within itself, for instance, between consumer capacity and production capacity. How do you keep consumer capacity uh, going? Well, you need to find certain forms of production which, which allow that to happen. And those new forms of production are, are, are contradictory in many ways. Uh, for instance, uh, one, of the, one of the things that maybe I mentioned this before, of you, you need is, is consumer capacity, which is, which is such that it can instantaneously uh, engage in the act of consumption. That is, there is zero temporality attached to consumption. Now, one of, one of the... So capital has flooded into areas which are zero consumer time. One of those areas it's very interesting right now, is tourism. Tourism is about the consumption of an experience. And actually, the total number of trips, foreign trips, uh, recorded by, I don't know, the tourist association in the world, was 800 million in 2009. It's now up to 1.4 billion one of the big hits that's going to come from this virus is tourism. 
it's done in. I mean, Japan is already in problems, it's got problems. Because one of the biggest tourist expansions in the last few years has been Chinese tourism, particularly to, to, uh, throughout areas of East, East Asia. Well, but the interesting thing about this is, think of the infrastructures you need to build for a tourist industry. Think of the airline flights, think of the airports, think of the, you know, think of, I mean, the vast amount of value goes into the creation of the infrastructures for something that's going to be consumed instantaneously. So when Marx kind of says this requires consumer capacity, and the act of realization requires consumer capacity, and when it wants, needs, and desires, you need to foster wants, needs, and desires for instantaneous forms of consumption. The other way you can do that, of course, is you know, this is the formation of the Netflix economy. A lot of money goes into producing. You know. so, so you can play with, with what's going on here in these passages, and you can sort of say to yourself, well, okay, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, and and uh, why, why does capital been pouring into uh, say, the production of spectacle. You know, big sports events, Olympic Games, and how significant all of these are as spectacles, and, and, and how the society of the spectacle has been characterized and, and, and developed. Uh, actually in recent times. So when you, when you take this, it's, it's, it's interesting to sort of just lay all of this out and say, well, okay, in what sense is, is some of this going on, and, and, and why is it in the nature of capital to do it, and how does it produce certain contradictions? And, and what are the forms of the contradictions? And what are the limits and the barriers? So this then gets him into, uh, um, well, okay, how do we understand what Marx, and this is on bottom of 410, where he talks about the relationship between Ricardo and Sismondi, when he says, Ricardo conceived production as directly identical with the self-realization of capital, in other words, Ricardo assumed that there was no problem of realization. Actually, Marx, throughout the whole of the first volume of Capital, assumes there's no problem of realization. The whole analysis uh, leaves that whole question to one side. And he says he's do that's what he's doing. Uh, to, to be fair to him, he doesn't pretend he's doing anything different. But when you get into the question of realization, a whole set of different issues start to crop up. So he says, Ricardo was heedless of the barriers to consumption or of the existing barriers of circulation itself. But he says that in so doing, uh, and in emphasizing the development of the forces of production and the growth of the industrial population, supply without regard to demand, he therefore was able to grasp the positive essence of capital more correctly and deeply than those who, like Sismondi, emphasize the barriers of consumption and of the available circle of countervalues. And this is where the tendency to sort of take production and the gospel and consumption as kind of secondary comes from. The whole dispute, he goes on to say, as to whether overproduction is possible and the necessary in capitalist production revolves around the point whether the process of the realization of capital within production directly posits its realization in circulation, whether its realization posited in the production process is its real realization. Sismondi, he says, emphasizes not only the encounter with the barriers, but their creation by capital itself, and has a vague intuition that they must lead to its breakdown. 
He therefore wants to put up barriers to production from the outside through custom law, which of course, as merely external and artificial barriers, would necessarily be demolished by capital. On the other side, Ricardo and his entire school never understood the really modern crises in which this contradiction of capital, which is a contradiction between production and realization, this contradiction of capital discharges itself in great thunderstorms, which increasingly threaten it as the foundation of society and of production itself. Now, one of the things that's, be, that's, that's happening in, in these passages in Capital is that Marx is always hinting at the potentiality for crises and the possibility of crises. And you start to see that crises can arise in all sorts of ways. For instance, when Marx kind of says it becomes necessary for capital to drive beyond national barriers and prejudices, as well as beyond traditional, confined, complacent, encrusted satisfactions of present needs and reproductions of old ways of life. Well, there's a lot of cultural resistance. And that goes back to the whole kind of question of the production of culture and the reproduction of culture and the destruction of cultural forms. But there's a lot of resistance. And while capital may be destructive towards of this, all of this, as he says, and constantly revolutionize it, tearing down all the barriers which hem in the development of the forces of production, the expansion of needs, etc., and the exploitation and exchange of natural and mental forces, well, there are barriers. And those barriers are constantly with us. It's not as if it's all a done deal and it's all kind of, it's, it's all worked out. I mean, Marx's language here is, 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 is kind of so interesting because it contrasts so dramatically with the uh, 70-odd pages of interminable calculations. I mean, he suddenly switches into this very visionary language about, you know, this is the nature of the essence of capital. He starts talking about the essence of capital and what it's about and what it's going to do and how it's going to do it. And he has this kind of, I mean, Obviously, this must have been one of those nights when he's sitting in, his, you know, in the middle of the night, smoking like a, you know, a chimney and, and taking lots of cups of coffee and, and just freaking out and writing this kind of, uh, this kind of stuff. So he obviously got tired of the, of the tedious uh, calculations and, and, and lets loose on this sort of thing. Um, so he then, then takes this a little further when he does talk about some of the kind of common processes of, uh, of uh, um, overproduction and has a few interesting kind of comments and the, well, let's go through these and then maybe we can have a sort of, uh, more general discussion. Uh, firstly, Throughout Capital, on, on several occasions, and we'll see this cited, on page 414, he, he raises the question of competition, where he says, conceptually, competition is nothing other than the inner nature of Capital, its essential character appearing in and realized as the reciprocal interaction of many Capitals with one another, the inner tendency as external necessity. Competition, and he, Marx talks about the coercive laws of competition. But competition doesn't in itself explain anything. And he comes back to this again and again. But competition is the mechanism that enforces something else. And that something else is the law of value. And the law of value 
is really the law which dictates how labor will be utilized, how it will live, and in other words, the classic case of this uh, is the argument over the length of the working day. I mean, Marx basically kind of says, all right, the length of the working day is something that individual capitalists will want uh, to try to occupy and to extend. But if I extend the length of the working day in my factory from eight to ten hours, and everybody else stays at eight hours, then I get an excess profit. And I could actually start to charge things lower and start to drive people out of business. So at a certain point, if I go from eight to ten hours, everybody else is going to have to go from eight to ten hours. This is how the coercive laws of competition work. So it then says that all labourers are going to have to work ten hours. And if uh, the capitalists start to say, some capitalists start to say, well, maybe I'll work people 12 hours. And suddenly it goes to 12 hours, then everybody's going to have to do 12 hours. Now, this is the competition which is enforcing the law of absolute surplus value. And at some point, people realise this is very destructive. So you have to put the base under competition. And the base would require that the state come in and say, uh-uh, you cannot have a working day more than 10 hours, or 8 hours, or a working week of more than 40 hours a week, or whatever. So state regulation becomes absolutely critical to control the coercive laws of competition. But you can see how the coercive laws of competition work. And the danger is, as Marx puts it, that the coercive laws of competition are likely to uh, create capitalist practices which could, in effect, kill off the worker. So the ridiculous, kind of reductio ad absurdum kind of result is that competition could actually kill off your, work, your workforce. Now, we find similar things in the exploitation of any common property resource. The competition leads to the super exploitation and the destruction of, for instance, of soil fertility. It leads to the destruction of natural environments, it leads you know, to greenhouse gas emissions, it leads to all these kinds of destructive ways. So, the competition is the means by which certain propositions are enforced. And this means also that there are certain barriers which capital throws up and which have to be mitigated within the logic of the system, which in, in the case of the working day uh, involves state interventions. And, 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 and it is interesting because the struggle over the length of the working day is initiated by workers. But at a certain point, capital sees a certain logic in it and says, yeah, we sh it's just a good idea. So it actually helps stabilize uh, the capitalist system by having some sort of state regulation of the length of the working day. So at a certain point, capital no longer opposes certain limitations of the length of the working day. So Marx here uh, is going to talk a, quite a lot about the whole kind of problem of overproduction, the possibility that surplus is in the drive to create surplus value, you create surplus products which cannot be absorbed in the market, and that means that there is a, a devaluation 
and loss of value uh, because consumption cannot keep pace uh, with the production. Uh, this can be uh, uh, got past in, in a number of ways. He raises the question of foreign trade. Well, maybe you could sell it in what I call a spatial fix uh, that uh, you can sell your surplus product to China or you can uh, give people credits to buy your surplus product uh, so that they owe you. So the credit system comes in and international trade. Um, and uh, he then, Marx also talks about uh, the fact that there are, there are independent classes who are just simply consumers and don't produce anything. And the larger the class is of, uh, uh, of parasitic uh, consumers, uh, then this can uh, actually be helpful in certain kind of ways. Uh, and then, of course, the worker comes into the picture. And 420, 421, I think there's a very interesting uh, argument. And in which he puts it this way, every capitalist knows this about his worker, that he does not relate to him as producer to consumer, and he therefore wishes to restrict his consumption. So every individual capitalist wants to restrict the consumption of their workforce. Because by restricting their consumption, you reduce the value of the labor power and you maximize your own surplus value. So in the drive to maximize your own surplus value, you drive the wage rate down as far as you possibly can. He then says, of course, he would like the workers of other capitalists to be the greatest consumers possible of his own commodity. So you want everybody else <laughs> to pay their work as well so they can buy your commodity, while you, as an individual, are going to... You know, this is where the coercive laws of competition then, of course, enter in. Uh, so the, you know, f f the individual capitalist uh, considers the whole remaining working class as consumers and, as, and, and, and doesn't think of them as workers, but think of them as participants in exchange. The problem, he says Marx, is the demand of the laborer himself can never be an adequate demand. Nevertheless, it is a significant demand. Uh, and uh, the, the, the restriction of worker demand uh, by this process of, of ex expanding the surplus value by uh, reducing the wage rate uh, has uh, a very important uh, impact on working class consumption. But then he adds at the bottom, what precisely distinguishes capital from the master-servant relation is that the worker confronts him as consumer, possessor of exchange values, and that in the form of the possessor of money, in the form of money, he becomes a simple center of circulation, one of its infinitely many centers in which his specificity as worker is extinguished. This is a very important point. When we talk about the working class, are we talking, uh, we're not talking about them as consumers. We're talking about them in terms of their relations to production. But here is Marx saying they have a significant role to play in realization. But that significant role is not a class role. It's the role of buyers and sellers. And the workers go into the marketplace with their wages and they're simply buyers. So Again, what is this person? Is the, the person a, a worker or a buyer? And Marx's argument is they're both. And at certain points in their lives, they will behave like buyers. At another point in their lives, they're, they're behaving like workers. So it's not as if there is a, a, a sociological category over here called worker. And Everybody's in that or they're another category over here called buyers. 
No, there's a relationship between worker and buyer. And as buyer, they behave as buyers do. They don't behave as workers. Now, Marx doesn't do, spend much time, just occasionally he mentions the fact that, yeah, well, of course, they may be exploited in the market process by, famous thing right now, the pharmaceutical drug company pricing strategies. You increase the drug. So, you know, people will revolt against that, but it doesn't matter whether they're workers or middle class or anything else. If there's going to be a struggle against pharmaceutical pricing, it's not going to be a working class struggle in the sense that people are making the struggle as workers, they're making the struggle as buyers, and all buyers who, who, who need those, those, those drugs are going to be participating in, say, some sort of struggle over the relationship between workers and buyers. So Marx never reduces the worker to simply, okay, they're workers and nothing else. No, they're people with all kinds of playing different roles. They have a role as worker, but they also have a role as, as buyer. Now, in terms of the dynamics of struggle, which are going on in the world, are we seeing struggles of buyers these days, or are we seeing struggles of workers? And how many of the struggles which are being fought, say, over affordable housing or gentrification, those kinds of things, are not working class in the sense that they are, actually have a different logic in terms of the form of the struggle. One of the arguments that I want to make is that if you accept this, that the worker, the specificity of the worker is extinguished when they go into the market, then you can't really call a struggle against pharmaceutical price gouging a working class struggle in the specific sense. You might well say it is something which is particularly important kind of struggle to be waged for all of those all of that population which is in an income bracket where this kind of question of pharmaceutical pricing becomes important. With the idea that really billionaires are not going to care, care too much. So the argument, argument here is that working class consumption and working class consumerism is important, but it's important from the standpoint of consumption capacity and the relations which are established between buyers and sellers in the market and to the degree that there is exploitation going on through the pricing strategies and the monopoly pricing strategies in that market, there is a form of political struggle which is a class struggle of a certain kind but is not working class in the sense that the narrow sense that you, you started off with. Now, we may collectively say, well, let's call all of those struggles uh, working class struggles and let's have a, but then in that case, you move away from the, the, the if you like, the, 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 the imaginary of the worker as being a factory worker or something of that kind, you, 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 you actually would end up incorporating a lot of uh, petty bourgeois, middle class, population who are struggling over housing prices and price gouging by the pharmaceutical companies and all those kinds of things, which, which, which are struggles which have a class component, but it's not a class component which is easily locatable in relationship to, quote, a working class as narrowly defined uh, here. So this is then uh, some of the issues that are raised uh, in, uh, in this text here. We're talking about circulation, we're talking about realization, we're talking about the essence of capital, uh, we're talking also about the complexities 
which go with all of the barriers and the contradictions which get set up. But for me anyway, one of the crucial questions which cannot be avoided, I think, in terms of an analysis is to think through what Marx calls uh, the contradictory unity that always must exist between production and realization. And to recognize that issues of realization, in terms of the totality we're looking at, are just as significant and just as important as questions of production, even though qualitatively the issue of production is foundationally different from everything else that's going on in this circulation process. So that would be the way I would want to, to look at these, these questions. So let me stop here and let's see what you all think. I'm particularly interested to get your take on the civilizing mission of the, of the bourgeoisie and how civilized you think it is. Thanks so much for this, David. It was really uh, helpful. And um, my question is not about the civilizing mission, but I wanted to go back to where you, you started and invited us to think, really in the, all the lectures, but then again tonight, about the different moments in an overall totality. Um, and you know, you're, you're discouraging us from prioritizing production, but rather to see it as a moment, right? And you're saying that has where you concluded that has implications for understanding class struggle, though that weren't your terms. Um, so I, I'm just trying to think about this with you, and it, it provokes some questions for me, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you might elaborate a couple of the claims that you make. I mean, are certain moments in the process more weak links than others? I mean, you, you said, look, we could look and, I mean, you make a great point, the coronavirus, messes up tourism, we see there's panics in the market. Uh, that's not a working class revolt, that upsets the system. But does it upset the system in the same way as stopping production would in terms of opening up for a strategy for, for anti-capitalists? That's the first question. And um, I guess th there's a couple of questions that follow from that. I mean. If our analysis of these moments in the overall totality are for the purposes of, say, destroying capitalism, uh, how would we identify, you know, the weak link? You know, the the, the most effective site to to intervene. I have millions of other questions, but I'll just stop there. Well, but you know, I mean, I I don't have a definitive answer. To, to, to that. I mean, I think it's a very, I, I tend to say that at a given historical moment and a given historical situation, uh, you don't know what to prioritize. Uh, and I, I would make the argument that a lot of the, uh, for instance, a lot of the urban struggles which I'm interested in studying, I mean, take something like uh, uh, the Gezi Park uprising in, in Istanbul in 2013. And you kind of go, in what sense was that a working class struggle? Uh, no, it was about, uh, in, in a way, it's about qualities of urban uh, daily life in the city. It began like that. Uh, and as nearly always happens, it's happened in Chile, it's happened in Baghdad's happening everywhere right now. We, we get this situation where there's some sort of protest of this kind and, and, and uh, political power calls on the police to go out and thump the living daylights out of everybody. And then all that does is to bring out a massive group of people who are protesting against the police brutality. So there's a dynamic now. Would I want to say that if we got rid of all police brutality and we didn't do things like Gezi Park, that we would be in a happy world and we didn't, wouldn't have to engage in struggle? The answer is no. There are underlying problems uh, of, uh, for example, the conditions of, of, of labor uh, in, in the factories of the world 
which are mainly located now in East and Southeast Asia, and with some in Latin America and so on. Um, so I, 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 and those struggles would, 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 would need to be addressed by organizing and, and the point of, of production. But I think the case for anti-capitalist struggle is just as much going to arise out of, uh, say, some of the urbanization struggles which, which we've seen unfolding. I don't, so, so I think one of the reasons that I, 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 I want to keep every, you know, everything in view is then ask the question, to what degree will a struggle over, over, over this particular issue lead us into uh, uh, an anti-capitalist struggle? At, at this particular moment, the, the virus question is about the virus. Uh, it could evolve. In, in such a way as to ask certain questions of where are these viruses coming from? Where did they originate? Actually, they originate for the most part in the food production systems, many of which uh, have moved into industrial uh, forms of uh, particularly animal rearing and so on. And, and particularly arise out of certain kind of capitalistic practices in relationship to, to the production of those kinds of foods. I mean, you know, we've had uh, SARS, swine flu, bird flu, you know, all of them. A lot of them are coming out of a certain production systems, in, particularly in Asia and, and for the most part southern China, where, where the conditions in the food supply system <laughs> are of a certain, certain sort, so we then kind of go, well, something's got to be done in relationship. But we have our own problems of, of food supply systems, and you, at some point or other, you ask the question, to what degree can the capitalist form of agriculture actually work in such a way uh, as to not produce these kinds of uh, uh, re viral revolts, if you want to call it, call it that. To what degree can that lead then into anti-capitalist struggle? Now, th this sort of thing comes up in the environmental movement. To what degree uh, are environmentalists anti-capitalists? A lot of them are not. Bloomberg most certainly is not an anti-capitalist, and he's a very strong environmentalist in certain fields. But the nature of the environmentalism is very much infected by the fact that you cannot, in Bloomberg's case, go beyond certain attacks upon the environmental question, because if they affect uh, the capitalist dynamic, then he's not gonna, they're not gonna go there. So um, when you kind of say, where's the weakest link? Well, the weakest link is all over the place. Uh, and you never know where the weakest link is going to be, and you never know where these particular problems are going to erupt. When they erupt, my in instinct is to kind of try to say to them, now what degree is there present within this particular struggle, uh, the possibility of talking about this in such a way that it leads into the logic of anti-capitalist struggle, and to what degree is it possible that these sort of questions which are arising over, say, greenhouse gas emissions and all the rest of it, can be resolved without challenging the dominant economic model, which, which is that of uh, capital circulation and accumulation uh, forever. I mean, I think that one of the things we have to do is to use this kind of framework to try to see how something like, uh, say, the virus problem or the pharmaceutical overcharging monopoly pricing problem, how far those problems, uh, where they exist, uh, where they can be located, uh, and to what degree uh, finding solutions to them is, or, or, or finding uh, forms of struggle which are coalescing around them can be merged into a general anti-capitalist struggle. That's the kind of issue that I would want to, to, to get into. I mean, I fully recognize that not all 
anti-gentrification struggles are anti-capitalist. Not all uh, environmental struggles are anti-capitalist. Uh, not all anti-racist struggles are anti-capitalist, so on. So we've always got that, that, that problem. But at what point will those struggles start to morph into something which is a broader kind of anti-capitalist struggles? And to what degree would it, should anti-capitalist struggles be looking at how to relate to these struggles going on elsewhere. I mean, my, my problem with the excessive emphasis upon uh, uh, production is that uh, I think we miss a lot of opportunities that way by kind of saying, eh, it's not work a struggle. Uh, so I'm not going uh, to, I'm a good, uh, where's the working class? You know, and you kind of go, no, and I think that's also the significance of what. Marx does here when he says, well, the worker, when they go into the marketplace to buy their food, they, they're acting as buyers not in, in relationship to sellers. And the buyer-seller relation is problematic, and a lot of struggles occur around buyer-seller uh, conflicts. I participated uh, last week, uh, uh, last weekend at a seminar about ideologies, and um, a person came up to, uh, and there were some old feminist Marxists uh, around, which, uh <laughs> and uh, they. Uh, I'm old enough to remember them. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a critique. It's just it was a, it was good that yes, they were right. there. No, 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 fantastic. <laughs> so and it's just um, then the, the Marx got criticized, and one thing that the the theory of Marx was criticized for was to say that uh, uh, Marx was a bourgeois himself, and that the bourgeois theory. <laughs> itself, that the, a new th uh, the new way to look at things should not come from somebody who has himself uh, bourgeoisie uh, background. Well, um, I think is <laughs> I do separate things, so I think he has a, well, I, I, I'm an anti-capitalist as you are, so <laughs> but I was wondering maybe you can, you know, just reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, I don't. You know. <laughs> if you if you erased uh, all the thinking and all the work that's been done by dissident bourgeois radical thinkers from the leftist tradition, you wouldn't be left with very much. Um, and and yeah, no, I mean there are. Uh, you know, it's not as if there are no problems that arise out of that. But, you know, I think it's, and, and, and it, it is difficult uh, not to be infected, if you want to call it that, by sometimes by your own class position and your own positionality within divisions of labor. Um, clearly those things do have effects and so it's not as if uh, one can say, oh, no, no, I'm not, in, I'm not affected by the fact that I can have a bourgeois lifestyle, modest bourgeois lifestyle if I want it. Uh, yeah, of course I'm affected by that, but you, know, you have to be self-aware and try, try not to let it get too much into your psyche. Which it does, you know. <laughs> I, I do like a good bottle of wine every now and again, I confess, and then people kind of go, oh. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for the discussion. This was a really rich uh, section to read, I think. There's, there's yeah. a lot to think through in, in the end, too. Um, but, you know, just one thing to jump off of the conversation you had with Jordan. Um, one thing that very much is on my mind right now is um, struggles at points of circulation. So in Canada, for example, is, you know, incredible 
uh, system, series of barricades across the rail network, wow. across the whole country. And these aren't, I think, we would be stretching these to call these working class struggles, um, but they're very strategically focused anti-capitalist struggles um, that are happening now. So I think there are many lessons to think about points of circulation, which may overlap with what you've been saying the last couple of weeks okay. about um, the tourism industry as well, which of course revolves around airports right. and other points of circulation. But I want to take up your invitation to think about this question of civilization on page yeah. 409 right. and 410. Another thing that's very much on my mind right now is the situation in India, um, where you have, you know, Ijaz Ahmad calls this across the third world, this eruption of irrationalism. And this isn't just, you know, um, this is in many ways the fruition of decades and decades of planning of, of extreme right organizations yeah. um, that have some political arms and cultural arms. Um, but they're also in alliance with some of the biggest uh, bourgeois concerns in the country. Um, and so, you know, it's precisely some of the language where he says, uh, you know, uh, the great civilizing influence of capital, the production of a stage of society in comparison to which all earlier ones appear as mere local developments of humanity as nature idolatry. I mean, this is precisely what Hindu nationalism, the entire political project, which is also an economic project. Right. I mean, it's all about nature. It's all about these local cultures, you know, this yeah. nature idolatry. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, uh, I guess there's a real tension just see seeing how that is playing out now in my mind with reading this. And I also think maybe of Marx's writings on 48 or the 18th Brumaire and the role of the bourgeoisie in certain specific historical moments yeah. of, you know, very violent uh, repression of working class, in those cases, working class struggle. But here we could say maybe working class life or Muslim life or Dalit life? No, I think uh, you know, many of these struggles which are occurring today, I mean, my, my tendency is to um, try to ask the question, in what ways can you uh, identify uh, the rootedness of some of these these movements, and for instance, the, uh, the move to evangelical Christianity in Latin America, for example, which has displaced uh, Catholicism, and particularly the Catholicism of uh, theology of liberation, and, uh, and has moved in a particular way it's, it's moved. Now, what, what is it that's, that, what, what might be uh, the underpinning of, of, of that. And I think that when you start to look at the nature of and the history of some of the struggles which have existed, I mean, I, I don't know India too well, so I can't really comment on that. I think my sense in, in, in Latin America uh, is that a lot of the problems have derived from the fact that the, the dominant economic model which uh, has been foisted on Latin America you know, particularly by the Chicago boys onwards, uh, has not uh, actually delivered. And then what happens is you get, and, and, and it certainly doesn't deliver either in terms of the, of the hoped for democratic movements. When you come out of the military dictatorships, uh, the hope would be for some sort of democratic movement which doesn't really uh, instantiate itself. So the failure both the, the failure of the political economic model, if you like, uh, becomes widespread and people become alienated. And I tend to be, want to use the category of alienation to then kind of say, well, alienated populations are very much uh, liable to uh, subscribe to irrational movements and seek meaning in religion, or seek meaning in in nationalism, or uh, some kind of uh, uh, which political power the bourgeoisie tends to encourage. Uh, I mean, right now, if there's a problem in the United States, do you think uh, political power would 
be prepared to blame capitalism as opposed to immigrants. I mean, if there is a real problem with the way capitalism is working in this country, do you think it's going to be exposed by the mainstream press? And if people say something's really wrong here, what is it? Well, it's immigrants or it's lazy, you know, it's people of color or it's, you know, feminists or it's, I don't know. What is, you blame anything except <laughs> what that which is at the root of the problem. And I think one of the things that I would want to try to do from this is to say, are there ways to try to understand the root of the problem? And partial understandings of the root of the problem are often there, but, but then that is the point at which an organized left has to seize those moments. Uh, and to me, what was astonishing about Brazil, for example, in 2013, there's massive uh, uprisings in pretty much all the cities of Brazil over, started with transport and then it came everything else. And, and, and then it became against police violence and all the rest of it. So you had a pretty much a, a, almost a left-dish occupation, but there was some right-wing involved too. And then two or three years later, it's all right-wing. Well, how come it became all right-wing and, and, and the left didn't get in there and kind of say, okay, this is, this, here's the nature of the problem, this is what we're going to do about it. Recognizing that you're going to run up against immediately all of the institutions of power in the media and, 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 and powers of that kind. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think these, these issues need to be thought about in the long run. And I think the um, anti-capitalist positionality, which I think, by the way, is not, is, is not dead in Latin America at all. Uh, there's quite a bit of it around. It's just they're, they're, they're really having to be defensive, play defensive right now. And, and I don't know about what's going to happen with, in India with uh, Modi, but certainly the, 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 the left there has a big chance, it seems to me, to do some things, given what, is, what, what seems to be going on in terms of all the, the massive protests which are uh, being organized. But how we relate to those struggles is a big, uh, um, uh, a, a big question. And I think one of, one of the things that comes out of a reading of Marx is, that, uh, is um, a way of thinking about, well, OK, how do we position ourselves and how do we organize the critique? But, but recognize that, that it's, not a, it's not a moralistic critique. It, it's even, a, 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 and like in these passages, a, a semi-appreciative critique that the bourgeoisie has brought us to this point in history where there are these possibilities, very real possibilities to do all of these things in a radically different way. Why are we not doing them? Well, it has everything to do with the foundational social relations of a bourgeois society, which is about the class relations. Um, uh, actually, you just did talk, uh, talk about the labor in Marxist uh, theory today, and uh, I have a question really bothers me. Um, because of the optimization that uh, many simple works maybe do not to use labor anymore, and uh, the machines can do the same work and even uh, more effective, and I wonder uh, if the surplus value comes from the labor, is it possible one day that uh, the laborers will lose their jobs um, totally? I mean, especially in recent um, in recent days, I, I saw many changes in China, such as the small uh, shops we do not use salesmen. We can choose the how to say the things, uh, and even I don't u to use my credit card. Uh, I can use a machine to scan my face and uh, to pay for uh, it through it through my account so i just feel worried about the the relationship between mm -hmm. machine and mm -hmm. labor thank you 
Yeah, that's going to be uh, one of the big issues that Marx does get into much later in, in the Grundrisse over the whole kind of question of uh, uh, machine culture and machine and, and uh, what that does to the value theory and, and, uh, and the like. Uh, my, my feeling about this is that, that there's always been the potentiality to displace labor and, and to use automation and, and so on. And of course, there's been a good deal of progress that way and artificial intelligence is taking it even further. I don't, I don't see that as necessarily negative. I don't see it as necessarily posi positive either. And the whole history of these innovations is it depends who takes these innovations and what they do with them and how they're utilized. And there has to be agreement over that. And of course, uh, the, the politics of the internet over the years, I mean, for a while, politics were very progressive. Uh, and then along came the monopolists and now they've essentially dominate the platforms and you know, they, you know, they've become very rich and, and it's become part of the bourgeois system. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's like uh, the printing press. Initially it was seen as a vehicle of liberation and increasingly, of course, uh, the print media has become so kind of monopolized and everything that it becomes harder and harder but at least we still have the possibility of, uh, of using social media for political purposes to some degree. Uh, and uh, you know, then, then there's a struggle over who gets to use it and how, and how it gets utilized uh, also in terms of the construction of, um, I, I mean, I, I actually quite like the idea of uh, having an automated existence, the only trouble is that you need to be fairly sophisticated to know how to manage the thing, and I'm hopeless at managing uh, any of this. Uh, you know. I keep forgetting my passwords. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I get into these wonderful circles where it says it can't give me a password because I've already got a password, which I don't know what it is, and I can't find out what it is. So I get into these fantastic loops <laughs> within the system. <laughs> So I have to rely on, uh, you know, some five-year-old kid to come and sort it out. <laughs> okay, we should uh, stop around now, right? Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, next, no class next week. Um, and then the week after that, so in two weeks, we will do pages uh, 423 to 515. Okay.